بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم ما بعد أيها الحبة في الله continuing on in our study of شر السنة by Imam Barbahari رحمة الله عليه we reach the portion of the treaties which as with the rest of the treaties discusses the usul of Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah the aqidah and manhaj or methodology of the Salaf of this Ummah what the Salaf of this Ummah were united upon uh, upon qawaid and principles to practice the religion of Islam with the correct understanding and this is what many of the books of Ittiqad or Aqidah those early Rasail from the early Imams the Imams of the Sunnah who compiled the treatises regarding the Aqidah and Creed of Ahl Sunnah they were establishing those principles that were principles taken and to be understood as the medhab or minhaj or methodology of the Salaf of this Ummah. They were a codification of the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That's why it is in, this book is entitled Shara Sunnah. You know, the, and as it's commonly translated as the Creed uh, by Imam Barbahari because the Sunnah here refers to all aspects of the religion. Because as Imam Barbahari mentioned in the beginning of the treaties, Al Islam wa Sunnah wa Sunnah to Hil Islam. That Islam is the Sunnah and the Sunnah is Islam. And letting us know or being a very clear indication that we cannot separate the Sunnah, the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and this is a refutation on those people who refer to themselves as Quraniun or the people who refer to them as Quraniun those people who claim to make ta'zim of the Qur'an, they claim on their tongues to believe in the Qur'an, but they deny the sunnah. And the reason we say that this is a claim and this is complete falsehood and based on lies and fantasy, in fact, is because it illustrates that they don't read the Qur'an because the Qur'an tells you to follow the sunnah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَأَتِيُوا اللَّهُ وَأَتِيُوا رسول. All throughout the Qur'an, many verses in the Qur'an, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and follow, or obey Allah and obey the Messenger. So this lets us know that you cannot separate the Qur'an and the Sunnah. And you cannot say you follow the Qur'an and not follow the Sunnah. And likewise, as is mentioned in another ayah where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Allah mentions that obeying Allah and obeying the Messenger and those charged in authority amongst you. So, this brings up the next point in Shara Sunnah that we were discussing, and this is the 35th principle, and this is the statement of Imam Barbahari where he says, تلقوني على الحود وليس من السنة كتال السلطان فإن فيه فساد الدنيا ودين. This is a قاعدة عظيمة in the Ahl Sunnah. And you can go back to many of the books of fiqh, and I uh, probably would have been more appropriate to mention some of those. But we've mentioned it on so many of our lectures, so many of, uh, and and if you go to my research, there's extensive work I've done on this topic, bringing the statements. Uh, 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 from Kitab wa Sunnah and the uh, statements of the Salaf of this Ummah 
and also dealing with some of the shubahat or doubts of the Khawarij and the neo tekfiri groups, those groups who believe in rebelling and speaking out and cursing the rulers and attacking the rulers and spilling the blood of the Muslims. Those issues have been dealt with count in countless times. Uh, I, I've dealt with them in many, alhamdulillah, uh, of our uh, brothers from the students of knowledge and, and those, mashallah, some of those thulab uh, some of those uh, students of knowledge that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has really favored with a lot of knowledge. They've dealt with these issues in their lectures. So I, my advice is to return back to those books and even other explanations of Shara Sunnah that are in English that the brothers have, have done good work on. Uh, go back to these issues and you'll see extensive uh, statements, but will suffice just with a few basic things. It should suffice as just with the, the statement of the Prophet ﷺ. But let's go back to the translation of what Imam Bahari said. So he said, It's not permissible to fight the leader. And not rebelling against him. And the ulama, they mentioned that this rebellion also can be a rebellion of the tongue. the tongue, And this is where Ahl Sunnah differs with a lot of the the modern day, uh, well, with the Khawarij first and foremost, but also a lot of other groups that may not be as extreme as the Khawarij and the Tikfiris, but they hold a very different view. And I was just reading something very uh, fantastic. Why? Because it was a very good uh, piece of research where one of the uh, professors in Jamiat and Imam, he has a very nice piece of research about protest. And he was mentioning a fatwa that uh, it, it, it was the foundation of his book was in having a knowledge-based discussion of the evidence that the scholars in Al-Azhar, may Allah guide us in them, they have a fatwa where they say that the majority of the scholars in this time hold the view that it's permissible to protest. And, uh, you know, kind of like the, the actions we saw in the Arab Spring, for example. They say the majority. And perhaps they're right that the majority say, and even in their fatwa they say, except this minority, uh, this very small minority of Salafis. This is what they say. The Azhari scholars, they say this. This is the nuts of the fatwa. I read it myself. I have it in book form right here in fact and maybe this is munasib for us to to uh, discuss uh, some of it right uh, at, the, at this point that here the the, the, the title of the book Anak al Majozi al Mudaharat wal Itisamat so it is uh, it's his criticism of those uh, people who hold the view that it's permissible to protest and to have sit-ins because the, the scholars of Azhar, they're united because this is a fatwa from them, that they're saying that it's permissible and they say the majority of the scholars of the Ummah in this day say that it's permissible to uh, have protests and have sit-ins except this tiny minority of Salafi scholars. And the uh, author of this book, Dr. Abdulaziz ibn Muhammad al Said, who's a professor at Jamiat al-Imam, uh, he brings a very nice discussion of their evidence and so it was enlightening to me to find out what their evidence and they, they brought their evidences and, and of course it requires the, the ulama to deal with their evidences you know their shubahat because if even just a, a student of knowledge or, or someone who doesn't have much knowledge and not like the scholars and especially not like the major scholars were to try to deal with it it would be uh, very difficult because they are scholars they're not people who are just ignorant you know, and they have major scholars from the people who we consider to be Ahl Bid'ah because they have Yukhalif, they go against the Medhab, the Minhaj of the Salaf of this Ummah. But they bring a lot of, of their own evidences and they have a, a, a discussion, a, a, a discussion uh, based on a knowledge based discussion. But what we see as Imam Baba Hari laid this foundation, uh, you know, and, and established this foundation which is based upon the foundation established by the Salaf of this Ummah and the great Imams, the four Imams and before them the Tabi'een saying that it is not permissible to rebel against the Muslim authority. 
and they get this from the Nasus of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam from the text from the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. This is what the strongest evidence leans towards. Most of the evidence we see from the other, those who hold another view is not coming from the Salaf and they'll mention some rare examples which can be Shubahat of some of the Salaf of this Ummah who did revolt against certain oppressive wicked leaders but they were the exception and they were not a part of the qaida the, the principle and because an individual of the salaf this is a principle that we have to know because an individual of the salaf or even a sahabi radiyallahu ta'ala anhu majma'in did an act of ijtihad you know where they they strove to make a uh, to make a jurisprudent ruling. And this is something we need to pay attention to because this can deal with a lot of the shubahat, the doubts that the people bring. And I, I, I was able in my research to be enlightened to this fact because I had a lot of wonderful sittings from one of our mashayikh, Sheikh uh, Abu Salah al-Afghani, Allah Ta'ala, who also did his PhD thesis around this subject so I had many private sittings with him and he used to really give me a lot of fantastic uh, his time and may Allah reward him and really help me because some of those things were confusing when I went into the books and I saw some of the uh, statements of the Salaf and I saw what the Takfiris used and I saw what the uh, you know the the modern day especially the modern day Khawarij and Takfiris what they used they were using some heavy uh, statements from the Salaf not from the Nasus necessary, not from Kitab Sunnah, but they were bringing statements from, from the Salaf. And it, it was confusing. It's like, wait, wait a minute, he, he, here we're saying that the Salaf had this view, and he's bringing statements and actions of some of the Salaf. And the Sheikh was able to sit me down, calm me down, and enlighten me to uh, uh, how to deal with those, those, those doubts. And, it, and, and, and again, trying to get back on topic, is it lets us know that the action, even if it's a sahaba, a sahabi, radiallahu ta'ala anu majma'een, uh, an action of ijtihad, and we're talking about an issues, not in creed, we're talking about an issues because they didn't have ijtihad in creed. But if it was an, an act of ijtihad in an issue of fiqh, that doesn't mean that we follow it or that it was correct. It was an act of ijtihad that they will be rewarded for but that does not necessarily mean we follow it. For example, in the issue of wudu, uh, Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala anu majma'een, from his ijtihad in understanding the statement of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, who said, you know, it, you know increase your wudu, uh, because on the day of judgment, you, uh, the, you, the, the, the person will be resurrected according to the athar or, or the, the traces of his wudu. You know, so Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala anu majma'in, and he didn't do this in front of uh, the people and stuff, but he used to, in order to make tatbik of that, and what he thought from his ijtihad, radiallahu ta'ala anu, and he will be rewarded, one reward for that, not two, because it was not correct. We cannot follow Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala anu uh, in this mas'ala of making the wudu. He used to make the wudu up to his shoulders, radiallahu ta'ala anu. So it shows us that in an issue of ijtihad, where you may have a person or a couple of the salaf or what have you who did an action, that doesn't mean we follow it. That doesn't mean that it was correct because it goes against the jamhur, the majority of what the salaf. This is when we say we follow the minhaj or the methodology of the salaf. That means we're going to those things they codified, those things they were united upon. When we talk about their position with Ahl bidah we talk about what they were united upon. The Salaf, you know, we find thousands of, of narrations on how they dealt with Ahl Bidda, not to sit with him, not to, to eat with him, not to be companions with him, uh, you know, not to uh, uh, support them. All of, these, all of these various narrations of the Salaf. So then it's codified. It's codified, codified in the madhab of the Salaf. And likewise, the issue of khuruj against the Sultan, of going against the rebellious leader, or I mean the sinful leader, that uh, there were some oppressive leaders throughout the history who some of the Salaf, some Tabi'een and so forth, had rebelled against. But they're not Khawarij because they didn't make this an issue of Itiqad. They didn't 
make takfir of them, but they fought against them because they saw that they were killing Sahaba, they were killing Tabi'in, and they were threatening the the religion, and they were pressing in, and and and, and you know to an extreme level, and so from their ijtihad they rebelled. But that was not the uh, qaid, the rule, and especially after them became codified with a known uh, from the salaf that this is impermissible and this is what Imam Baba Hadi is saying so that's why he said it's not permissible to kill the Sultan uh, to rebel against the Sultan or fight the Sultan and revolt against them even if he was sinful and this is in accordance with the statement of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to Abi Dhar al-Ghaffari radiallahu ta'anu who said Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam be patient even if it was a an Ethiopian slave and also the statement of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to the Ansar in which he Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said uh, be patient even uh, uh, be patient until you meet me at my uh, hold in Jannah letting us know to be patient with the sins of the the rulers even if it's a sinful wicked ruler as long as he's still in the uh, in, in the in the fold of Islam it is not permissible to, re to rebel against him and this is what the Salaf codified uh, especially in the time after the Tabi'een uh, or during the Tabi'een really but after the Tabi'een it's Ba'a Tabi'een and, and, and those later it became codified that this was known as the Madhab of the Salaf and those who went against that uh, you know were uh, you know wicked sinners and generally only generally tended to be from the Khawadij generally tended to be from the Khawadij that they held this in their Aqidah, in their creed. And so this also distinguishes between rebellion and being uh, a Takfiri Khariji. That there is some distinguishment that the ulama, the, ulama, the earlier scholars, uh, they made this distinction. And even Imam Noah, he makes uh, uh, speaks about this in his book. I think it's Minhaj al uh, uh, uh In his book, it's a, a book on fiqh, where he speaks extensively uh, about the ahkam or the rulings pertaining to uh, rebels and so forth and fighting the rebels and, and what you can do and what you can't do and, and that you don't take ghanima from them and so forth because they're still Muslim and so the ulama they distinguish between the khwarij and the uh, and the khwarij their belief is is pertinent towards aqidah it isn't just a matter of rebelling but it has to do with uh, issues of creed as well and then Imam Barbara said, وَلَيْسَ مِنَ السُنَّةَ كِتَالَ Sultan فَإِنَّ فِيهِ فَسَادَ الدُّنْيَ وَالدِّينَ And so by fighting the, the uh, Imam uh, Barbara, he said, and it's not from the Sunnah to fight the Sultan uh, because by doing so, it spreads wickedness in, the, in, in this life as well as the hereafter, meaning that it's sinful. And it's wicked, and it, it spreads wicked. And and in this time, without even going to history, all the countless examples in history. But if we look in the modern day uh, context, in the twentieth century, all the examples from Somalia to uh, Iraq, Afghanistan, uh, uh, Syria now, and many other places that when in Egypt, Tunisia. Libya, all, none of those places. In fact, we can say, safely say right now, every single one of the places I men, mentioned are places of turmoil up to now. Somalia, for example, has not had a stable government that has ruled all of Somalia and that gives Somalia the full recognition and stability that it needs to grow for now, more than 20 years, you could say they have been in turmoil, chaos, fitna, and war. And part of this has to do with rebellion against wicked uh, leaders. And the tribalism and all the other, the other factors that are involved. But this is part of the factor. Removing Saddam Hussein. He was not just a rebellious, wicked leader. He was a disbeliever. As well as po possibly the situation of Somalia too. But the point is, what was the result of that? What was the result of that? The result is that blood is still being spilled. Iraq still has no peace. 
and a very weak authority, and now a Rafidi Shi'i, Shaitani authority that uh, oppresses and causes wickedness for the Muslims. No one benefits. Even they don't benefit. There's no stability. Bombs in the marketplace. You know, Tunisia, Egypt, bombs, killing, Libya, fighting, Egypt, the instability. And this is the facade in the dunya that we see. And what about the facade in the akhirah for those who people who contribute to that chaos and that fitna? So why Ahl Sunnah takes a, a position of asper? Because this is the statement of Imam Barbahari. This is the statement going back to the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Asbir, be patient, even if he was an Ethiopian slave. And Sheikh Rabi mentions a very fantastic uh, benefit with regards to that, that uh, with the point of making, uh, being patient, even if it was an Ethiopian slave, he also mentioned that even if the leader had taken the authority by force, that if a leader now, were to unite the Muslims, not like we see in Iraq, but someone uniting the Muslims, and they took the authority by force. We don't recommend that. But as far as the ahkam shari that the ulama have spoken about extensively in the books of fiqh, that if someone were to take and unite all the Muslims legitimately, and they took the authority, then, then it would become uh, upon us to unite under that leader. If they had the, they took the, and they had the legitimate authority, that then it would not be for us to continue fighting and continue to be against that that authority. So the sheikh mentioned that faida, and you'll find that in the books of uh, of fiqh written uh, extensively, especially the more ex the extensive books in fiqh. Some of the other benefits the sheikh mentioned, he said, "Asladil muallif bi hadith Abi Dhar al Sabak." وفيه أيضا حديث إرباد ابن سارية رضي الله تعالى عنهم أوصيكم بتقوى الله وسمع وطاء وإن عبد هبشين فإنه من يعيش منكم بعد فصير اختلافا كثيرا. The Sheikh mentioned حفظ الله تعالى. He said uh, Imam Baba Hari رحمة الله عليه uh, used this evidence for not rebelling against the Sultan and fighting the Sultan and not revolting against the Sultan and speaking out against the Sultan. The Hadith of Abi Dhar. Uh, that was already mentioned. And he said also the hadith of Irbad ibn Sariya, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, which is the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam where he said, Usikum bi taqullah, I, I, I order you with fearing Allah. And we mentioned taqullah azza wa jalla many times that it is adhering to the commandments uh, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and avoiding his prohibitions. Usikum bi taqullah, I advise you or I order you with fearing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَسَمِي وَطَعَ And hearing and obeying. People don't want to hear and obey. Allah understand. And hearing and obey the Muslim authority. Then he said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when Abdin Habashin, even if it was an Ethiopian slave. فَإِنُّهُمْ مَنْ يَعِيشْ مِنْكُمْ بَعْدِي So whoever lives after me, فَسَيَرَى اخْتَلَافٍ كَثِيرًا will see many differences. فَسَيَرَى اخْتَلَافٍ كَثِيرًا they will see many differences. Don't we see many differences? We see many differences, unfortunately, f arguing and debating and making tabdi' and tafsik between Ahl Sunnah. Then we see the ikhtilaf and kathir between the jama'at, between the groups. We have Ahl Sunnah, and then we have many other groups and sects who are fighting against Ahl Sunnah and arguing against Ahl Sunnah and cursing Ahl Sunnah and, and disagreeing with Ahl Sunnah and disagreeing amongst themselves and making takfir. Ba'dhum min ba'd or ba'dhum uh, ala ba'd that we see the groups just like the original khawarij they used to make takfir of one another and we see that these groups look at nas, look at the situation of ISIS or is or whoever Islamic State versus a nasr a nasr of the group in Syria now these groups have basically a common they have a common ideology no doubt and they have a common goal and a common minhaj to achieve that goal they both want to establish Muslim authorities, Sharia, and maybe the Khalifa. One is emphasizing ISIS or is, Islamic State is emphasizing to be the Khalifa. You know, they've made bay'ah, they have the Khalifa, their Khalifa. Then you have the uh, uh, Nasr, they have their methodology and they have their own leader and they want to establish uh, and they have their own, some of their own goals which depart from the other group. These groups are the same, but they, 
fight one another. They spill one another's blood. And I'm sure if they don't make tick fear, their predecessors did make tick fear one of another. You know, they make not, do not consider one another uh, 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 legitimate Muslims. Enough so to where they spill one another's blood. Well, I understand. So this is the case that you'll see. And the Prophet ﷺ prophesies this. You're going to see many differences. And then he gave us a prescription. So it's upon you, my sunnah, and the sunnah of the rightly guided Khalifa, meaning Abu Bakr, or uh, Umar, or Uthman, or Ali, radiallahu ta'ala anhu majma'in, that that's our prescription. Now that may sound uh, general, and it is general, but it means adhering, this is why you see the Salafi myth, madhab and the Salafi minhaj, and I, I believe in that minhaj, that's why I preach it, that's why I spend my time trying to learn it and propagating it, because I believe really even when we see all these fitna and these shubahat and these doubts and these things, you know, you have people who bring in all kinds of delil. They say you should fight, go with uh, uh, Islamic State, do this, go Boko Haram, blah, blah, this group, jama'at this, jama'at that. I believe in the Salafi minhaj. That it's really, it, 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 it takes being humble and going back to those nasus. The Prophet ﷺ said, Asbir when kana abdani habashin. Be patient, even if it was an Ethiopian slave. So even when you see your leader, maybe uh, maybe you don't feel your leader is worth being the leader in your country. Maybe you see the leader doing outward sins and allowing sinfulness going on. And this is, of course, going to be the case in everywhere to a greater or lesser extent. But as long as they're still Muslim, they, uh, they don't have open kufr, as the Prophet ﷺ said, kufr bawaha. And they still implement the Salat. They still establish the Salat in their land. It's not permissible to rebel against them. This is according to the statement of the Messenger of Allah wasallam. And then this is what the, what the Salaf of this Ummah codified. So that's why it's important to to, to give these uh, Nasus their Haq. And there's countless uh, Nasus which illustrate for us from the Qur'an and the Sunnah this qa'idah or this principle that Imam uh, Baba Hari mentioned. In another hadith of the Prophet Alihi, after salatu wasalam, he said, this is a hadith of Ibn Abbas, 